few words about me. Uh, I'm from Poland. Uh, I was living in Warsaw a long time, and the, uh, now I'm living on south of Poland. Uh, I have few years experience in, with big data technologies, mainly with Spark, but right now I move a little bit to DevOps part, like Kubernetes, Docker, and so on. And I was very interested how those technologies are connecting together, like uh, Spark, Kafka, and the new technologies like Kubernetes. So this is the pre this presentation about. So I will start with the introduction to Kubernetes. So the first question to you is, how many of you heard about Kubernetes? Please raise your hand. OK, half of you, something like that. How many of you uh, used Kubernetes on production? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Nice. OK, and how many of you mixed Kubernetes with the big data tools? Two and a half. <laughs> and two more here. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so I think you can change the presentation and <laughs> uh, I will talk to others. Okay, so let's start with the very, very short introduction to Kubernetes because I want you to know the basics of this uh, environment. And then I will move, the second part will be about how to connect Kafka, Spark, etc. Uh, how to run it on Kubernetes. So, uh, you heard about Kubernetes, so I probably can skip this slide. Uh, Kubernetes was created by Google and then open sourced. And it was based on the Google internal system Borg. Uh, and Kubernetes originates from Greek, means helmets or pilot. Why use Kubernetes? Why this? Uh, you can see this is the Google Trends. You can see that uh, Kubernetes is raising a lot, and other systems uh, like Docker Compose or Mesos are the, the line is flat here. What about Hadoop? Uh, the green light is Hadoop. So this is the Hadoop three years ago, and here you can see that right now Kubernetes is more popular than Hadoop and Hadoop is declining. Uh, the uh, word for Google Trends was Hadoop. So all the environment, all the everything, based on it. Right now, it's the most active GitHub project. You probably know about, about this. And uh, Kubernetes has support from every main cloud provider, so you can run it on Google Kubernetes Engine, Amazon Elastic Container Service, Azure Kubernetes Service. Even if you have your business in China, then you can probably run Kubernetes on uh, Alibaba Container Service. I don't know if there is Russian uh, cloud here, but probably if it is there, there is a Kubernetes Engine for it. Okay. So, why Kubernetes is so popular? Uh, we have, normally if, you are, we are, if we are running containers, uh, if we are running Docker containers, we have only one container, which is the one application. In Kubernetes, we can group these containers in, if so, uh, to something which is called logical host. So, for example, we can have, uh, let's change it to this. We can have only one container. This is this square here. Uh, but we can mix the container with the storage or mix two containers. For, for example, we can have one uh, database and some application that it's using this database. And this is grouped. And this pod has one, one IP in the Kubernetes cluster. And all the services can talk to each other using localhost uh, IP address. Also the, net, also, the storage is shared between all the services and all the containers in the, in the pod. So this is, the be, this is the building block of everything on Kubernetes. We have pods. This is the building block. But if we are running these pods, if we create the pod, and then the pod will, uh, will be killed by something like uh, server crash, then that's that's all. So we want to have the mechanism that we that will ensure that number of pods, number of the pickups of pods will be constant, and we have deployment for that. 
So we can tell in deployment that we need three copies of our web service. And if one of the pod in this deployment will die, then Kubernetes will create another one to have three copies. We can also scale uh, deployments, uh, change the number of pods uh, for two to ten if uh, traffic increase or, uh, or for ten to two if traffic decrease. Also, deployment gives us ability to, to do the rolling upgrade. So we want to deploy a new version of our application and we will be uh, upgrading pods one by one. And deployment is great for the stateless service. So we don't have storage here. Only, uh, only stuff like web applications. Uh, then, standard problem is that one of our part of our system wants to talk, talk to other part. Uh, and Kubernetes solved this using services. Uh, so, for every pod, we can create uh, we can create constant IP address uh, and uh, stable DNS name in the cluster. So we can create web service. Tell us that this is web service one dot cluster dot something, and uh, even if we change the number of pods or uh, scale or upgrade this deployment, uh, we will have the same IP address, which create load balancing between the pods, and we will have the same DNS uh, name all the time. So we can use one, one deployment from another. So it's start of the microservice architecture here. We can have deployment for every uh, microservice, and then talk uh, between microservice using services. Okay, and it's clear. Uh, there will be the uh, recap of this at, at the end. Then we can add the uh, storage. We have persistent volume, and if you're using Kubernetes on the cloud, this is uh, this is done by by the cloud provider. So you're just specifying, I need one terabyte of storage. Then AWS or something will create the storage and attach to the pod. That's easy part. The main problem is, when talking about big data tools, that the, many of those tools are stateful. I told you before that the deployments are for stateless services, and we have tools like Zookeeper or Kafka that have the state. And here we have stateful set uh, that also have one more thing, that every pod here has stable network name. So if we are creating deployment, then the name of the pods in deployment will be random. If we create stateful set, then the first uh, pod will have name, for example, Kafka 1 dot something, second one will be Kafka 2 dot something, etc. So all the, uh, all the pods can talk with, it, with each other. If in Kafka cluster, this is very important. In Zookeeper cluster, the same. Also, we have rolling uh, uh, updates, uh, scaling, etc. And also, we can sp uh, specify the storage for every pod here. So we're sp uh, telling, OK, we have pod with one terabyte of storage. And when scaling up, the, uh, the Kubernetes cluster will create all new pods and new storage for those pods. So this is for the stateful services. And the last one is for logging, uh, monitoring, etc. When we want to have one pod for, per server, per node, then we want to create them on set. So to sum up, we have pod, and this is the, this is the main building block. Uh, we have deployments for the stateless application, stateful set for the stateful application, and daemon sets for monitoring, rogging, and cluster storage. Normally, when you're deploying your application on the Kubernetes cluster, you will probably use deployments or stateful sets. 
this is this will you get from the uh, some kind of source in the internet and you're not creating pods in other uh, way than testing something okay i will skip this and let's do the let's do the fairy tale sorry The other day, my daughter sidled into my office and asked me, Dearest father, whose knowledge is incomparable, what is Kubernetes? All right, that's a little bit of a paraphrase, but you get the idea. And I responded, Kubernetes is an open source orchestration system for Docker containers. It handles scheduling onto nodes in a compute cluster and actively manages workloads to ensure that their state matches the user's declared intentions. Using the concepts of labels and pods, it groups the containers which make up an application into logical units for easy management and discovery. And my daughter said to me, huh? And so I give you, the Illustrated Children's Guide to Kubernetes. Once upon a time, there was an app named Fippy, and she was a simple app. She was written in PHP and had just one page. She lived on a hosting provider, and she shared her environment with scary other apps that she didn't know and didn't care to associate with. She wished she had her own environment, just her and a web server she could call home. An app has an environment that it relies upon to run. For a PHP app, that environment might include a web server, a readable file system, and the PHP engine itself. One day, a kindly whale came along. He suggested that little Fippy might be happier living in a container. And so the app moved, and the container was nice, but it was a little bit like having a fancy living room floating in the middle of the ocean. A container provides an isolated context in which an app, together with its environment, can run but those isolated containers often need to be managed and connected to the external world. Shared file systems, networking, scheduling, load balancing, and distribution are all challenges. The whale shrugged his shoulders. Sorry, kid, he said, and disappeared beneath the ocean's surface. But before Fippy could even begin to despair, a captain appeared on the horizon piloting a gigantic ship. The ship was made of dozens of rafts all lashed together, but from the outside, it looked like one giant boat. Hello there, friend PHP app. My name is Captain Kubi, said the wise old captain. Kubernetes is the Greek word for a ship's captain. We get the words cybernetic and gubernatorial from it. Led by Google, the Kubernetes project focuses on building a robust platform for running thousands of of containers in production. I'm Fippy, said the little app. Nice to make your acquaintance, said the captain as he slapped a name tag on her. Kubernetes uses labels as a name tags to identify things, and it can query based on these labels. Labels are open-ended. You can use them to indicate role, stability, or other important attributes. Captain Kubi suggested that the app might like to move her container into a pod aboard the ship. Fippy happily moved to Kubi's giant boat, and it felt like home. In Kubernetes, a pod represents a runnable unit of work. Usually, you will run a single container inside of a pod, but for cases where a few containers are tightly coupled, you may opt to run more than one container inside of the same pod. Kubernetes takes on the work of connecting your pod to the network and the rest of the Kubernetes ecosystem. Fippy had some unusual interests. She was really into genetics and sheep. And so she asked the captain, um, what if I want to clone myself on demand any number of times? 
Well, that's easy, said the captain, and he introduced her to the replication controllers. This is deployments. Those before Replication deployments. controllers provide a method for managing an arbitrary number of pods. A replication controller contains a pod template, which can be replicated any number of times. Through the replication controller, Kubernetes will manage your pod's life cycle, including scaling up and down, rolling deployments, and monitoring. For many days and nights, the little app was happy with her pod and happy with her replicas. But only having yourself for company is not all it's cracked up to be, even if it is N copies of yourself. Captain Kubi smiled benevolently. I have just the thing, he said. No sooner had he spoken than a tunnel opened between Fippy's replication controller and the rest of the ship. With a hearty laugh, Captain Kubi said, Even when your clones come and go, this tunnel will stay here so you can discover other pods and they can discover you. A service tells the rest of Kubernetes' environment, including other pods and replication controllers, what services your application provides. While pods may come and go, the IP address and ports of your service remain the same, and other applications can find your service through Kubernetes' service discovery. Thanks to the services, Fippy began to explore the rest of the ship. It wasn't long before Fippy met Goldie, and they became the best of friends. One day, Goldie did something extraordinary. She gave Fippy a present. Fippy took one look, and the saddest of sad tears escaped her eyes. Why are you so sad? asked Goldie. Oh, I love the present, but, but I have nowhere to put it, sniffled Fippy. But Goldie knew what to do. Why not put it in a volume? <laughs> A volume represents a location where containers can access and store information. For the application, the volume appears as part of the local file system, but volumes may be backed by local storage, Ceph, Gluster, Elastic Block Storage, and a number of other storage backends. Fibby loved life aboard Captain Kuby's ship, and she enjoyed the company of her new friends. Every replicated pod of Goldie was equally delightful. But as she thought back to her days on the scary hosted provider, she began to wonder if perhaps she could also have a little privacy. Sounds like what you need, said Captain Kuby, is a namespace. A namespace functions as a grouping mechanism inside of Kubernetes. Services, pods, replication controllers, and volumes can easily cooperate within a namespace, but the namespace provides a degree of isolation from the other parts of the cluster. Together with her new friends, Fippy sailed the seas on Captain Kuby's great boat. She had many grand adventures, but most importantly, Fippy had found her home. And so Fippy lived happily ever after. The end. Okay, this is not the end of the presentation. <laughs> or, um, okay, standard program. Hmm. Okay, let's try one more time. Okay. Uh, so we have Kubernetes, and we have the, all the things I told you before. But the problem is that if you want to deploy sample application to Kubernetes, you need to write a lot of YAML files, really a lot. And this takes a lot of time. So the idea is, let's do the package manager for Kubernetes. And I don't know, have you heard about Helm? The, okay few of you uh, so uh, but you probably heard about RPMs uh, and DEP packages so if those packages are for the operating system then the helm is the for, for Kubernetes and you have many repositories of these packages and around 300 different deployments right now and this includes 
databases like MySQL and Postgres, Elasticsearch, uh, monitoring tools like Prometheus, Vault, Nginx, Jenkins, whatever you want. So, uh, the problem is, what about big data tools on Kubernetes? We have the, this helm, but if we are starting to using big data tools, then the problem appears. Let's start with Kafka. As you probably may know, we have different components in Kafka, like Zookeeper, Kafka Server, Schema Registry, Kafka REST Service, and Kafka Connect. So, question to you. Uh, what's the best deployment option for Zookeeper? Remember, you have pod, deployment, stateful set, and daemon set. So, what do we will choose, yeah? Stateful set. And for Kafka Server? Okay, yeah, it's stay for set, I think is the best. And for the others, it's <laughs> it's deployment because schema registry, Kafka REST, and Kafka Connect doesn't have state. Uh, all, the, all the state information is on the special topics in Kafka. So we have this. Now, we want to deploy everything on the Kubernetes. So we have Helm, we are going to the official Helm repository and try looking for charts. For Zookeeper, there is, for Kafka ser server also. But if we want to use, for example, Kafka Connect, we have problem. Because there is no official or even incubator repository for the chart. So uh, we can go to the Confluent company. You probably heard about them. Uh, this is the company created by creators, original creators of Kafka. And they have the quite good charts for everything with all the components included, including even Kafka REST and Kafka Connect. And official, it's preview uh, with mainline, don't use this on production. I was using this on production successfully, so you can also try. And I will show you today how to install Kafka in a few minutes on the Kubernetes cluster. Then let's go to storage. We have HDFS, and one op option of uh, uh, installing HDFS is to uh, use Cloudera distribution or Hortonworks, right now it's the same, uh, and create big cluster only for Hadoop, uh, and spend a lot of money for the support or so, or so. And the other option is, let's try to install HDFS on the Kubernetes. And this is the same. I, th this is the same problem. We also need to have stateful sets here for the name node. For the da data node, it could be different. It could be stateful set or daemon set. Uh, and we have also uh, components like Zookeeper, Zookeeper failover component, and journal node. A lot of this. If you want to create Helm chart for HDFS, it, it will talk. I think we test around a month. And, of course, there is official chart. Don't use it. And there is project called Apache Spark on Kubernetes, and they have their own chart for HDFS. And it's quite good. I mean, it's working, and I think it's not production ready. But you can try it if you want, so. And if we have our data, uh, or on Kafka or on HDFS, then we want to process it. And I think that the most popular processing engines right now is first Spark and then probably Flink. And there are many ideas how to uh, deploy your processing engine on the Kubernetes. Uh, first idea is that Processing engine knows that there is Kubernetes. This is like Spark on Kubernetes or Flink on the R. So we are telling Spark, this is our Kubernetes cluster, use it. The second idea is that 
application doesn't know about Kubernetes, but knows about replicas. That's how Kafka Streams is working. So we can deploy any number of containers of Kafka Streams, and because all the containers uh, are using the same Kafka cluster, they know about each other and they can connect uh, in one cluster. And Kafka Stream is the only solution that is using this idea right now. And the last idea is that we are creating standalone cluster and just using Kubernetes to deploy the standalone cluster. And this whole thing is working. So let's start with Apache Spark. This is the most popular engine. And right now, work is in progress. There was the Spark on Kubernetes fork uh, created around two years ago. Right now, it's discontinued. And uh, in official Spark repository, uh, the community is still trying to merge all the features from this fork. The problem is that we have some of the feature working, right? like active mode, so the Spark knows about Kubernetes cluster. We have the PySpark and Spark R support. We can use uh, Spark in, in, with interactive tools like Jupyter uh, with client mode. But there are also things that are not working. So we don't have dynamic resource allocation. We, we don't have shuffle service. So that's the reason we don't have dynamic resource allocation. And there is no data locality. So if you create a HDFX cluster on Kubernetes and Spark cluster, you don't have data locality. And all those features were super so supported in Spark on Kubernetes fork. And probably they will get to official Spark in version 3.0. So maybe next year, something like, like that. Uh, OK. Uh, I don't know if you're using Thing, any of you are using this. Well, probably we can skip this because of the time. Okay, so this is the best part. So, mm, I will do, this like this. Okay, I hope you're seeing everything. Uh, okay, uh, I have the very small Kubernetes cluster on the AWS. Uh, this is three nodes cluster. And what I'm doing, uh, I will check that no, nothing is deployed right now. So I'm checking. Uh, if we, I have any pods, so nothing here. Yeah, I can do this. Uh, I don't know why it's not working. Better? It's okay? Okay. So, Let's deploy Kafka. Mm, sorry. What I'm doing here, I'm, I have uh, configured Kafka repository with the Kafka helm chart, and I'm just deploying the uh, Kafka part. And. Oh, now it's working. I will duplicate it. the screen. It will be easier for me to use it. OK. And I can see that Kafka is creating. Just in a moment. So you can see that I'm creating containers here. I have two zookeepers up and running. Third is create in uh, creation state. And I have three brokers up and running. And Kafka Connect, Kafka REST, and Kafka Schema Registry. So cluster is up and running in one minute, two minutes. 
and I can check that it's working. So let's let's go to the back. Okay. So I'm on Kafka, one of the Kafka brokers, and I can create a topic. Hopefully it will work, yeah. Or not. everything is working right now some errors still uh, normally if you have because uh, when you're creating helm charts all the components are starting in the same time so kafka it's uh, going to the crash crash loop uh, because zookeeper is not running and normally if you wait a few minutes then it, this will be work normally Let's try this one more time. And in the meantime, I will create. Oh, nope. Demo gods, demo gods are not uh, <coughs> raised. Uh, I will I will wait just a few minutes, and in the meantime, I I will show you the uh, the Spark part. So, what if we want to use the Spark, and if we are using the official Spark part right now? I will put this on the top. It's. Okay, so uh, if you are using the latest version of Spark and the latest version of Kubernetes, this is the result. Exception, it's not working. <laughs> yeah, it's open. It's open back for this. But if if you want to use Spark with Kubernetes right now uh, on production, you need to compute the Spark on your own. So I did it yesterday and if you uh, use spark you also need to create your own uh, docker images you have special tools for creating docker images of spark you need to use it and i'm using uh, my own docker repository i have it on uh, aws like you can you can see it here so I have private Docker repository. I'm creating Spark Docker images. There is tool for that. So you only need, you need to use the build and the push command. And then using the very long magic line, you can run Spark application on cluster. I will do this on the top. Okay, so I'm specifying that my Spark master is the Kubernetes cluster here. Uh, some I'm specifying that I'm using the Spark image that I built in the previous step, one executor, and everything is creating here. And I can show on the pods that I will get the Spark here. So you can see there is a Spark driver and there is a Spark executor. After the job is finished, there is only driver in completed state, and we can see logs of this driver. Logs. And probably you will get the, this is the Spark P example, so we are trying to uh, check what's the P, and P is well, oh, quite good so, uh, wizard for this. So we have P here. 
3.14.14 something. It's not bad for this for this algorithm. The algorithm is I'm, we are randomly choosing the number and checking if it's in the circle or out the circle. That's all. And Spark is calculating p like that. So uh, I think that the Kafka is not working. Uh, So I will try to de delete it and run it one more time. Okay, and in the meantime, the last part, it, I can use HDFS and I also can, can create HDFS. And in the, watch the pots here of HDFS. HDFS is working normally. There is no problem there. We need just to need few minutes and you can see in the meantime that the Kafka is terminating and the HDFS data nodes are creating, name node is crea in creating state and uh, Zookeeper is in creating state and after a few minutes you will get the up and running HDFS with the where data nodes are the daemon set, so we have one data node per node, and we can use the storage of the node uh, for HDFS storage. Okay, and let's try Kafka one more time. Uh, maybe this, this time I will be lucky. And here you can see that we have, uh, the, I would run this one more time, you can see that there is some errors of the HDFS, especially the name node. It's because uh, we don't have all the zookeepers, so the uh, name node will be crashing until the, all the three zookeepers will be up and running. And then after all the three zookeepers will be up and running, the name nodes will, will be created and then the data nodes. But it's also a few minutes. I think we have three, three more minutes, so maybe I will show you something. Let's, let's wait. Uh, I think that we can do the question set in the meantime and then check if everything is up and running. Uh, there is no question on the slide, though, on this hall, but maybe you have question from the audience. Oh, no, it looks better. Uh, hello. Uh, for example, we have a lot of Kafka Streams application. Uh, yeah. Each application should be replicated, should be balanced between nodes because of memory, yeah. CPU, yeah. and so on. But also, each application uh, has uh, its own state store. So what is the best way to deploy it? Uh, but how? Uh, where is this, the state store is connected? Uh, uh, in the, uh, each application uh, has a state store on the disk in the classic way. But, uh, but this is the standard st uh, state store of Kafka streams. You yes. mean the RocksDB? Yes, yes. You, I think you can use deployment here and then, because uh, when you're creating another replica of Kafka streams, then the st this state store will be recreated from the uh, Kafka topic. Yes, but recreation can take uh, a lot of minutes, hours, and okay. so on. Okay, so if this is a long process, then state for set. This is, the, this is your only so solution. And this will be working for Kafka Steam. So you're creating stateful set of your Kafka Steam application, and that's all. Uh, am I right that uh, stateful store means we choose not and it cannot be changed? No, uh, it can be changed. The only there is there is some limitation if you are using, for example, a stateful set on AWS that you can't migrate your stateful set uh, instance between uh, availability zones, but you can migrate them between uh, the nodes. Okay, thank you. Еще вопрос есть у аудитории? 
Uh, hello, thank you for your presentation. On your slide, uh, you mentioned the shuffle services yeah. that are not working uh, in uh, Spark 2.4. Uh, but uh, can you tell more what kind of shuffle services did you mean and why it is not working there? So we are not able to use group by in Spark? Or no, uh, I mean, a shuffle service is a special part of Spark that is used, for example, if you're using Spark uh, on Yarn in with dynamic resource uh, allocation. So Let's think about this. You have your application, you have, you're using 10 nodes uh, of your application, and then you're decreasing the number of nodes. But some of the data is still of these nodes because Spark put the data on the storage of the uh, nodes. Got, got here, so got the shuffle service gives this data to another nodes that uh, is still there. Yeah, and so the second question about the resource management. Uh, is there any resource management, some kind of uh, extra added for Kubernetes, or there is only Yarn for that is used uh, and built in Spark? Uh, there is th this connection. You can run Spark on Kubernetes without the Yarn. You don't need the Yarn. And how resource management is done? By Kubernetes. So, and uh, what kind of application or sub-application, what is its name? It, is it uh, it's, some it's standard, component? It's standard Kubernetes scheduler. So you're, you're just specifying that your Spark needs four executors, 30 gigabytes of memory each, and then uh, Kubernetes will create those executors as a containers. That's all. So everything is managed by Kubernetes. And it will kill them, yeah, if, if the, they will fail or fail with the exceptions? Uh, or out I of memory, Spark, for example? I think Spark driver is killing. Uh, out of memory no, is not killing. Correct, not correct, not correct. Uh, Yarn. Yarn is doing this job. And, uh, uh, when it's out of memory, then Kubernetes will kill them. OK, good. Thank you. OK, uh, I think that there is still a problem with Kafka, so let's <laughs> Skip this. Uh, yeah, it's, it's standard. Normally, if you are trying to mix big data technology with each other, yeah, that's the normal. But but HDFS is running, and it's and uh, it's working. I think we have some more time for questions. Yes, yes, so. yes, we have. Okay, so hit there. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, uh, I missed this part. Uh, is there like a Helm charge for Kafka Connect by Confluent? Yes. And the second part of the question: Are you in most cases in most most cases running Confluent platform, or do you have like have you ever tried to run like I run rebuild Kafka from from scratch? And you can you can run. Uh, uh, I'm using the, this. Uh, I think those charts needs to be run using official Confluent Docker images. They are built together, uh, but there for free you can use it for free using Confluent OSS platform and you don't need to pay Confluent for, for them. You have experience running it in production? So yes. <laughs> and th there were, normally if you're, if it started then it's working. The problem is the f with the first start sometimes and probably uh, yeah, you, you can see that. Uh, but then uh, I was ru running this and the performance of this on Kafka on Kubernetes was the same like performance on Kafka uh, on uh, Nodes. Thanks. Есть еще вопросы? Hi, small question. Uh, usually, there is when you're working with uh, volumes yeah. on top of uh, Docker and Kubernetes, so you have some performance impact on when you're writing and using those volumes. So, how had you experience? I think it depends because uh, you have two options. First, you're, if you're running Kubernetes in the cloud, then this is the same volumes if you, you uh, have on your nodes. So if you are using uh, Elastic Block service on AWS, you can mount this Elastic Block service volume to the node or to the container. And the performance is exactly the same. But if you have Kubernetes on premise, you can, you can, you can use a uh, local disk as a volume. There is specify uh, there is provisional uh, local volume provisional, and you can specify okay this part of disk use in these containers, but this have a uh, problem that you can't move this container to another node. But it will be working. Yeah, it will be working, but the performance impact no, will be exactly the same because you are using local volume. The performance impact you have if you are using. Uh, distributed file systems like Ceph, FS, or something like that. But if you are using local volume, the performance is the same because uh, there is no network between volume and the application. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, I think time's up. Yeah. Uh, к сожалению, время закончилось. Если у аудитории есть еще вопросы, спикер наш будет стоять на уголке Ask Me Corner, и вы можете к нему подойти и уже лично с ним обсудить вопросы, которые у вас появились за время данного выступления. Uh -huh. Thank you very much, Eva. One moment, one moment.